Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Perhaps you have heard the phrase used before, the real McCoy. It may not be as much common usage anymore, but back in the day, many years back, uh, the real McCoy used to mean something is authentic. Something is real, something is true. What is ironic about this phrase is the real McCoy was not so real. In fact, the real McCoy title came about fairly inauthentically. But let me tell you a little bit about where this phrase came from. Perhaps you know already, but there was a boxer by the name of Kid McCoy who boxed from about the late 1800s to the early 1900s. He was a bare-knuckle boxer before they had many of the rules that they currently have. And when he went out to box, he was very good at it. The kid was 81, 6, and 9. And if you don't know, that's 81 wins, 6 losses, 9 draws. Out of those 81 wins, he had 55 decisions by knockout. He was a good boxer. Well, because of his popularity and because of his skill, people started to copy his name. Other people started to call themselves Kid McCoy. They wanted to have the same fame. They wanted to have the same popularity. They wanted to be able to stand in that limelight. Well, it took a fairly significant match for the kid to prove himself. For the real McCoy came about after a match against Joe Chinitsky. And Joe Chinitsky, again, was an epic boxer of that era. He was the one who currently held the American World Championship belt. Almost a little contradiction, American world. But anyway, he held one of the top belts of the time. And after the kid defeated Joe Chinitsky in this 20-round match, he was called by the San Francisco Examiner, the real McCoy. Now, what was inauthentic about that was the man, Kid McCoy, was actually not McCoy. In fact, the Kid McCoy was a man by the name of Norman Selby. Norman Selby used this pseudonym, Kid McCoy, as he entered the boxing ring so that people did not know his real identity. He had a much more checkered home life, family life, than he did in the ring. But the reason I use this illustration as I bring this up today is because I thought to myself, I wonder how the people must have seen Jesus when he first came. Here you have John the Baptist, someone who we believe should have known Jesus. Agreed? John the Baptist should have recognized Jesus. We, he was cousins, after all, with him, or at least relatives, first cousins, second cousins there. And he should have known him. But on one hand, and you, you have him saying, Behold, the Lamb of God. But notice just a couple of verses later, I myself didn't know him. If you were a, peop, a person standing there, you have a bit of a mixed message, don't you? Well, is this the Son of God? Is this the one who's coming, or should I wait for someone else? Is this the promised Messiah, or is it another falsehood? Another person who's putting on errors? And John should have known. We expect John to have known Christ because of that relationship. Commentators have said, well, maybe the reason he didn't know is he had never seen Jesus' face. Maybe they had known each other even in the womb. He recognized him, but maybe he'd never seen his face, didn't know his voice. You might give an argument for that from the standpoint that, well, maybe because of John's, the age of John's parents, they moved on, and after they died, he was adopted. But I'm not completely comfortable with that explanation. It seems like we're making excuses more than we're doing anything else, doesn't it? No, rather... I think John was waiting for something else. I think John probably knew that was his cousin. I think John probably recognized Jesus, had seen him around. Some even believe that Jesus had followed John around when John first started preaching. However, what was John waiting for? John was waiting for the fulfillment of prophecy. He was waiting for the fulfillment of a promise of old. He was waiting for the beautiful Resurre the beautiful promise of forgiveness of sins that would lead eventually to the resurrection from the dead. And at this point, Jesus has, not, has yet to show him. 
or has he? Notice John's words there. I myself didn't know him, but then just look down to verse 32. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The beautiful truth is, is that at this point maybe John wasn't sure, but right at Jesus' baptism, right away he knew already because he heard the words of God, the Father. Behold, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. He had seen the Spirit descend like a dove and he would see greater things yet to come. He would see the greatness of Christ coming and dwelling among his people. John the Baptist would see and bear witness that the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised of old, was there. Although we have this testament of faith, though, I think that sometimes, in a manner of speaking, we wonder, is this the real McCoy? Not that any of you ask, is Jesus really the Son of God? Because I hope that you know that he is indeed the Son of God. But sometimes I think we get caught up in certain perspectives of Christ. We get caught up in one particular viewpoint. We do this with other people as well, not just Christ. Think about how we view certain people. If they've been good to you, you have a good feeling towards them. When you look at them, you think, that's a nice guy, that's a nice lady. If they've been bad, if they've done something wrong, wronged you in some way, you look at them as though they're evil. When other people ask you about them, it's hard to think of a good thing to say. And in the same way, I think at times, we have different perspectives on Jesus. And we get locked into these perspectives and get comfortable with seeing him in an only one way or only, only one form. For instance, there's a popular Christian song, if you listen to some of the conservative music, that refers to Jesus as the king of glory and that he is in his light. Certainly a biblical view. Nothing wrong with that view, except if that's your only view of Christ. Because when we look at Christ as the king of glory, the lamb who sits upon his throne, we can only see him as a righteous judge. We can only see him as one who is high and lifted up, but who is separated from us. And we need to be grounded as well. We need to step back down and see that the one who is high and lifted up was also high and lifted up on a cross. That not only is he the king of glory, but he has humbled himself that he may dwell among us. That he has experienced the same pains we've experienced. That he's experienced the sadness as we have. He's lost loved ones and friends. He's gone through the trials and tribulations we have. He's walked among us. And in some ways that leads us at times to see him in another perspective. The best friend, Jesus. Again, a biblical view of Christ. But when we strictly look at him that way, we miss out on the greater view, the more beautiful view of him. When we only see him as friend, we miss out on the other truth of his glory. We miss out on the fact that as our friend, he's there for us, he cares for us, but we miss out on the fact that he is also that judge who lived the perfect life that righteous one who could be our, take our place. That perfect friend is the one who is there for us. And that is Christ. But he's more than a friend. The last view, and this is the one that, well, biblical, is one that I, that I don't care for personally, and that's what I t term Grandpa Jesus. All of us, have or had grandparents, haven't we? That grandparent who sends us a birthday check or a birthday present, that grandparent who gives us the keys to the car or something like that. And some people see Jesus in that same way. They see him as the one who writes them the blank check, the one who does what they want him to do. And like I said, this isn't altogether unbiblical. Just consider John's word to the, or Jesus' word to the disciples in John chapter 14. He said, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, 
and I will do it. You may ask anything in my name, and I will do it. It seems almost like that blank check view is not so wrong. Except, notice three words that are in there. In my name. When we pray in Jesus' name, when we ask boldly in Jesus' name, we also trust that Jesus has a plan. That Jesus can see all that we need, and he knows that some of the things that we want are not things that we need. He knows that some of the things that we ask of him will be a detriment to our life rather than a blessing. And so he doesn't always say yes to our prayers. Sometimes he'll answer in different ways. And so when we see Jesus just as Grandpa Jesus, we miss out on the fact that he does have a perfect will and plan for our lives. So the question is, how do you see Jesus? Who is Jesus in your life? Is he your best friend? Is he that king of glory? Is he that sacrificial lamb? Is he that grandpa who does whatever you ask and need? See, when we start to look at Jesus just in a particular perspective or particular way, we miss out on the richness of the gospel. We miss out on the fact that greater than all else, Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Greater than all else, He is the one who lived the perfect life and gave His life as the perfect sacrifice. And we miss out on the fact that the Lamb of God forgives us all of our sins. What a beautiful message that is to know. That our Jesus, while we see the world changing around us, our Jesus never changes. That Jesus is always the Son of God. He's not like God. He's not similar to God. He is God. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the one who could fill our need. And He is that best friend. He is the one who provides for our wants and our needs. He is the one who hears our prayers. And He is the one who seeks after all those who are lost. Just think about the many people who are outside of us as we confessed in our, our confession today. There are thousands of people who do not know Jesus. They may have a conception of Jesus, a misconception of Jesus, as the pacifist Jesus, or as the judge Jesus, but they don't know Jesus as their Savior. It's like trying to take a picture with a dirty lens. They look, they look through their lens and kind of squint a little bit, and they shoot their picture, but when it comes out, it's blurry. And that's how their view of Jesus is. It's blurred. They have a little picture of Him, but they don't see Him. Only we, only we can show Him who He is. Just like John shouted out, Behold the Lamb of God. So we can show people, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away all of your sins. He is, in a manner of speaking, the real McCoy. He is the one among us who is authentically our Lord and Savior. He is the one who has made us sons and daughters in His name. He is the one who lived the perfect life, died the perfect death, and will one day bring us to the perfect life with Him. He is the one of truth who we have to share. The disciples, John, they weren't sure. There had been many false prophets who had come to them, who had shared this idea that they were there to help when really they were interested in themselves. We know it as Stoicism, Gnosticism, other isms of the day. And we're not so far different. People sometimes look at us and see us as false prophets. Sometimes people look at us as Christians and they say, are they the real thing? But when we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, when we tell them, when we show them that Jesus Christ is their Savior, they won't have to ask. They'll know that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of our world. Let us pray. Oh Christ, you have called us to be messengers. 
to be the ones who share your gospel message. You have called us to proclaim the truth. Lord, may we go forth willingly to share your love. Lord, may we not be afraid, but may we always have open hearts and minds to preach the good news. Lord, sometimes we get caught up in these false perspectives. These ideas help us to see the most important view is that You are our Savior. Help us to know that You are the One who came as a child, lived a perfect life, and died a perfect death to be our perfect sacrifice. Help us to know that You are indeed the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. In Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, we pray. Amen.